brother, the giver of power, is yonder, playing with his planet again. That small planet under the sun that has live things upon it? Let us see what he's doing. Cannot you leave these nasty little animals alone? These men? They are such silly little creatures, swarming and crawling. Why has the master permitted them? They are pitifully small and weak. But I like them. What is the good of them? Squash them. If they were not weak, they might not be so pitiful. But their lives are so short, their efforts so feeble. If they had power, they would be no better. I am going to try that. I am going to give them all the power I can. Don't. You are the power giver. You can give power beyond measure. What will happen if these silly, greedy human scabs who can only breed and scramble spread out among our stars? You will see. Are you going to give them all power? Yes. But limitless power? Power to do everything? There is a limit to the power I can give. So the master has decreed. That bit of grit is stuff at the heart of every individual no power can touch. The soul, the individuality, that ultimate mystery, only the master can control. Their wills, such as they are, are free. But all else, every position, every circumstance is mine. Don't give power to all of them. Try one or two first. That might not work. Just try one and see what there is in the human heart. Why not? Then perhaps we might see. Just any little fellow. They are all very much alike. I'll take one haphazard. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Fotheringay. Evening, Mr. Fotheringay. Evening, gentlemen. Evening, Mr. Fotheringay. Evening, Miss Maybridge. The usual. Please. We're just talking about miracles. Yes. You may not believe in miracles, Mr. Fotheringay, but I do. Not to believe in miracles, I say, strikes at the very roots of religion. Well, of course, Mr. Beamish, there's miracles and miracles. Exactly, Miss Maybridge. Now, uh, we, 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 we must let it make it clear what a miracle is. Some people would argue that the sun rising every day is a miracle. Well, some of us do. Mm. Not what I call a miracle. A miracle, I say, is something contrary-wise to the usual course of nature done by an act of will. Something that couldn't happen, not without being specially willed. So you say? Well, you've got to have a definition. Mm -hmm. What do you say, sir? Well? Oh, Mr. Cox? Oh, I'm not in this. Oh. Well, I agree. Something contrary-wise to the usual course of nature. Have it so. What about it? All right. Now, for instance, take, um, what? That lamp. That lamp, in the natural course of nature, couldn't burn upside down. Could it? You say it couldn't. Well, then you. You aren't going to say it could, are you? Well, then it couldn't. All right. Then well, then now. Yeah. Now, someone comes along, see, mm -hmm. as, it, as it might be me, and, uh, Stands as, as it might be here, see, and says to that lamp, as I might do, collecting all my willpower, and I'm doing it, Mark. I'm, I'm playing fair. Says, hear you. Turn upside down without breaking and go on burning steady. <coughs> Not possible. I can't keep it up any longer. It's got the drop! <laughs> now, Mr. Fotheringay, Gay, will you be good enough to explain this silly trick before I come and chuck you out? Whatever made you do it. Outside the place for you. Outside the long dragon for good and all. He's got to pay for the Mr. Cox. Yes, he'll have to pay for a, a lampshade and a chimney. Why has he did it, we? But, but look here, Mr. Cox. I don't know what happened to that confounded lamp more than anyone does. I swear I never... Come on, it. Mr. Conjurer. We I... don't want any more bother. Are you going to get out before I come and chuck you out? Come on. There, come on. There, there. I never...
don't understand what happened. Yes, but what did happen? A reason for Mr. Cox to be so violent. I didn't want the confounded lamp to upset. It was, it was when I said, ear you, that it turned upside down. Here you. Be lifted up about a foot. Don't lose your head, George McWhorter, following day. Don't lose your head. It won't drop, not unless you let it fall now. Now, keep burning steady. Don't drop any nasty grease about, and over you go, upside down. As you were on the table. A blooming miracle. Why, I can make any amount of money with a trick like this on the musical. I suppose I could do it to almost anything. Here, the table, here. Up. Down you go. Up, the bed. on the floor, my dear. Come down quietly. It's willpower and hypnotism and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Grow into something bigger. A, a beer comb like what conjurers have. Now, let's get some. I pressed her, but a kitten be under there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a young, healthy kitten. Here, kitty, 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 kitty. Here, you can't go under there. All these kittens make some mess. I'll be the devil to pay. Here. Kitty, 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 Rotten little pin cushion, you. Yeah, oh, yeah. Be changed into a pin cushion now. Uh, got you. Uh. Presto, vanish. And you'll be an extinguisher again, and we'll say no more about it. No. Oh, better be careful. Yeah. You scratches. Be you. I can go on doing miracles all night. for today. I'll better think it over. It won't do. Miracles dropping off the ends of your hands before you hardly know it. 
No, Mr. George McWhorter, our father in Gary. It'll make you no end of trouble. How are you getting on with our Mr. Fothengay, Ada? Don't you be vulgar, Mr. Stoker. I'm not getting on and I'm not getting off with him. Or anybody else, see? As it happens, I can see. You don't have all the chaps running after you without doing something about it, Ada. Don't tell me. You're just pretending to be jealous, Bill. You've got no reason. Morning. How's your arm? Oh, not so painful so long as I keep it in the sling and don't use it. I wear the sling to remind me. Oh, I'm so hungry today. I wish it was lunch. I haven't the heart for lunch. Feeling ill? Feeling freckled. Freckled all over. I've got two more. Powder isn't any good, Maggie. I'd be all powder. Besides, oh. he doesn't like it. He's nasty about it. Oh, well, never mind. What can't be cured must be endured. Oh, who's this sneaking through from the cotton department? Good mind to give him the cold shoulder. And you can't, I know. Oh, I could, but I don't want to. Oh, well, two's company, three's none, I'm all. You don't often come to see the haberdashery nowadays, Mr. Fotheringay. New attractions in the costumes, I presume. Oh, we know all about that. I keep my art in this department, Miss Hooper. Really? Really. Maggie, I've, I've been wanting to talk to you all day. Well, all morning. Really? Oh, serious. Maggie, something, something queer has happened to me. I can't make head in the tail. You've not been left money or, or won a lottery ticket? No. Something queer? Not falling in love. That happened a long time ago as well, you know, Miss Hooper. <laughs> really? Really. <laughs> they say you had more than was good for you in the long dragon last night and upset the lamp. It can't be that. It has something to do with it. Hmm? It, it, it odd. You see, it, it's like this. If I say let a thing happen, it happens. It's a sort of prophecy. No, sort of miracle. Oh, go on. Oh, true, I can prove it. Yeah. Oh, oh. oh of course, that's a trick, Mr. Fotheringay. That's one of your sleight of hand tricks. Oh, they're lovely violets. You didn't get this bunch for sixpence, I know. It's a good trick. It just seems to jump out of nothing. Oh, but if only one could work miracles. Just think of what you could do. For instance? Heal the sick. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Now, now, here's my sprained arm. What wouldn't I give just to lift things and put them away without thinking? Well. Lift it. Guy. You're a healer. You, you've got the gift of healing. It ain't everything I've got. But the good you might do. Oh, I suppose I might. Perhaps I will. Now, there's Effie there, heartbroken about her freckles. Her fella hates freckles, and, and she keeps on getting fresh ones. Well... well I'll try. Effie! Effie, do you know Mr. Fothingay has a charm for freckles? Go on. Yes. Oh, do do it, Mr. Fothingay. Come on. Let all your freckles be gone and your complexion be perfect. I 
how he came to me, I don't know. I, I just say to a thing, do this and do that, or be this and be that, and it seems to happen. Maybe it's willpower. I didn't know I had it till last night. When you broke the lamp in the long dragon. <laughs> Oh, well, don't you go breaking things here, Mr. Fotheringay. No miracles in the house or the shop if you please. This is a drapery establishment, not a home of magic. <laughs> <laughs> but it cured my spleen. And look at her. All the same, it isn't wise. Major Griggs is always fussing about breakages, as it is. What he'd say if he began throwing lamps about, I <laughs> don't know. <laughs> well, if I knew I was to always have it. I, I'd go in the music halls right away. Uh, I've always been thinking of that. I wouldn't. What would you do, Mr. Stoker? I'd do better than that. How? Oh. You tell rabbits to come, and violets to come, and complexions to come, and all that. You're the spirit of nature, Father <laughs> Jay. <laughs> but all that small beer. What's to prevent you saying, here, let's have 20,000 in the bank. A car pay, and a big house. Oh, yes. Maybe there's a limit, but it would be pleasant like to have that money in the bank. I'll think of that. But don't forget your gift of healing. He could have a miraculous hospital. What's to prevent him? He could start miraculous hospitals all over the place. Just go around once a week and clean everybody up. <laughs> Needn't stand in the way of other things. And how about a miraculous tip or so for the Derby? Lord, if I had your gift, I'd launch out. I wouldn't go on honoring Grigsby and Block with my services much longer. Pay our dues, Mr. Stoker. You have to give a month's notice, you know. The things you might do. You could be rich. You could be anything you liked. You could give presents right and left. You might meet all the celebrated people. You might go to court and see the king. Music halls, indeed. I, I didn't mean to lay it all out so soon. I, see, I'm a bit frightened by it myself. I, I don't mean to do much with it yet. Now. You listen to me, Mr. Fotheringay. Don't you do anything rash. You didn't ought to go about doing miracles just anyhow. You oughtn't to turn your gifts to selfish ends. Oh, here's uplift. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean it, Mr. Stoker. This gift of miracles and healing is something very serious. You ought to have advice about it, Mr. Fotheringay. That's plain sense. You ought to have advice. Yes, I suppose I ought to. I, I hadn't thought of that. There's uh, Mr. Maybig, uh, the new Baptist minister. No, no, he ought to go to the vicar. And a nice mess they would make of it for you, either of them. Righteous old buffers without any imagination, at least where the vicar is. And maybe he's just a spouter. You take my advice, Father Gear, and do yourself well. Don't give your gift away to anybody. There isn't a woman in the world who wouldn't love to have a man who could work miracles for her. You take advice, Mr. Father Gay. Come on, Jane, collect the plate. Miracle or no miracle, we've got to get on. We can't sit here and let the shop look after itself. Come on, come on, come on. Good night, madam. Good night. Come, 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 Mr. Fotheringay. What on earth is the matter with you today? Here we are, five minutes off closing time, and look at it, look at it. The place is in a muddle. Sorry, sir. I've had a bit of worry today. It won't take me long. You've got half an hour of tidying up for you. Here. Apple pie order. It hasn't taken long, has it, sir? Uh, no, you're, you're quite right. It hasn't taken long. I didn't quite follow you. It's queer, very queer. You're quite sure, Mr. Fotheringay, this sort of thing doesn't damage the goods? <laughs> doesn't good, sir. I can do anything. Absolutely anything. If I want to do anything to that old moon, I could do it. <laughs> All the saints and scientists in the world and nothing compared with what I can do. <laughs> and who's afraid, I tell you? Who's afraid? Oh. Oh, I broke my stick. Did they then, did they? Oh, what about Master's gift of healing? 
Yes, we'll make it all right and better. Here, be not a stick, but a, but a tree. A great big rose tree growing right there in the middle of the road. All covered with lovely roses and get your breath. Why, it's old Bobby Winch. Oh, I say, it'll never do. Here. Go back. Oh, oh. Leave him alone. Let that rose tree vanish. Hello, mister. What's the game? What's all this story about a bramble? I wasn't throwing any brambles at you, Mr. Winch. I was just doing what you call working a miracle. Oh, it's you, Mr. Miracle Worker. It's you, is it? This is how you spend your nights. This is how you do it, eh? Well, this time you've done one trick too many. Well, you're not going to take it seriously, Mr. Winch, are you? It isn't me that takes it seriously. It's the law. What, run me in? Me so respectable? Oh, you can't do it, Mr. Winch. I'm doing it now. Come on. No, I won't. You're coming. Oh, go to blazes. Golly, he's gone to... Where am I? He's got me into some sort of pitfall or something. He's followed in there, tricks. They laugh off to here, too. I better make a note of this. An officer should always make a careful note. What was the exact time? Why, oh, the paper's going round. It's on all the boats, too. Oh, dear, what is this? It can't be a nice place to go to. Can't send a chap to like that. Where's my stick? I'll... Oh, here. Yeah. Let my stick be back. Not broken. What am I to do about Mr. Winch? What am I to do about Mr. Winch? I, I can't leave him there. I, I can't bring him back. I... Oh, I know. <laughs> San Francisco. That's for nearly halfway around the world. <laughs> Let Mr. Winch, wherever he is, go immediately to San Francisco. <laughs> Oh, it's lovely. It's, it's heaven being like this. And to think you was jealous, Bill, of poor little Fotheringay. <laughs> Him and his miracles. <laughs> Must be awful late, Bill. Golly, it's past a half hour. Time we were indoors. The door of the lock will have to ring. We can't go back together. Every mum would talk. Yes. You go back to the front door. I'll go round the back and shut up the water pipe to the men's dormitory. I've done it before, and the window's never popped. Give us a last kiss, Bill. What the... Oh, Ada, you're the very girl I was thinking of. Why, it's George. Uh, do you know the time, George? Nice to be you and live out and not have to be in by half past ten every night. I, I could stay out all night in moonlight like this, couldn't you, Ada? Yes, it's lovely. It's real lovely. Uh, done any more miracles, George? Oh, nothing to speak of. Not much fun doing miracles alone. You sort of want an inspiration like a... Oh. Here. Yeah. See the church clock? Yeah, you and every clock and watch in Dewington be put back 20, no, 25 minutes. Now! See, my watch too. It'll be all right now, Ada. If you do have to ring and be let in, by the hall clock will bear you out. But, but it's a real miracle. This is nothing to what I can do for you. You know what, I asked them to put it back 25 minutes instead of 20 minutes, so that I can have a bit of a word with you. Well, you deserve five minutes, George. I can do extraordinary things for you. You, you seem to stir up my imagination. It's very kind what you have done. I could do anything for you, Ada. If only I could get you so as you sort of love me. I would indeed, so long as I could get you to Want to kiss me? George, miracles or no miracles, you mustn't talk to me like that. Oh, why shouldn't I? Don't you care for me? Not in that way, Mr. Fotheringay. Why not? I don't know. I just don't. 
Anybody else? Hey. Oh, I know. That's not your business, Mr. Fotheringay. Anyhow, I don't care for you, not in that way. You're a nice sort of a chap, but not my sort of a chap. Whether there is anyone or no one, it wouldn't make any difference. I couldn't love you. No? No. And supposing I was to make you love me? You couldn't, Mr. Fotheringay. You, you wouldn't, Mr. Fotheringay. Oh, oh, oh. Now, my lady, you be in love with me. You be hopelessly in love with me. You forget all about Bill Stoker and be in love with me now. No. That's where your miracles don't work, Mr. Fotheringay. That's where your miracles don't work. I have not no clock or a rabbit or anything like that. Good night, Mr. Fotheringay. Yes, sir? Send Fotheringay to me, please. Uh, ask Mr. Fotheringay to come and see me. Yes, sir. You sent for me, sir? Yes, sit down, Mr. Fotheringay. Sit down. I want to have a little talk with you. Sit down, sit down. Cigarette? Now, I must confess, I was very struck with the way you tidied your department yesterday evening. Very much struck. It was practically instantaneous, wasn't it? Now, I wonder if you could tell me how you manage that. I understand it's not the first thing of its kind that you've been doing lately. Well, I, I could tell you, and so to speak, I couldn't. Hmm? Roughly, you, you, you might call it a sort of miracle. Oh, come, come, Mr. Fotheringay. Isn't that rather an old-fashioned word, miracle? <laughs> well, say it's something... Contrary wise to the course of nature done by done by an act of will. Will? Ah! Now you're talking about something I can understand. <laughs> After all, a man doesn't build up a big and vital business like this, with three branches already and 49 assistants, out of one small shop with five hands in seven short years, without knowing something about willpower. Willpower over customers, willpower over patrons, willpower over assistants. But, uh, frankly, Mr. Fotheringay, you've never struck me as the kind of young man who'll go in for that sort of thing. Well, I haven't. It's... It just come to me. Have you ever studied dominance? Exercised your willpower against others? Tried to get down to feelings and motives? Well, I, I don't seem able to do that. But you have tried. Well, it wasn't much good. No, no, tell me, tell me. I just wanted someone to feel differently about me. It wasn't anything. Uh, never mind about that. Oh, I see a lady in the case, eh? <laughs> no, we won't talk about that. Come down to hard facts. I want to make you a business proposition. Now, I take it you could straighten up the shops in the evening, open the shop up in the morning, deliver the parcels to the addresses given all by the aid of miracles. Is that right? And naturally, you must confine your gifts entirely to our organization. No outside miracles. You get me, Mr. Fotheringay? Yes. Now, I've been working all this out. I've figured it out in my head. Now, for the first year, we can guarantee you, sir, an income of, um, 3,000 pounds. 3,000 pounds. And why? Because there isn't a competitor in the business we couldn't down by sheer rapidity and economy. We can extend over the coast. We can extend all over England. There's no limit with such an advantage. Oh, you may call me a dreamer, Mr. Fotheringay, but let me tell you that every great organizer of business is a dreamer. I, I could sit in that chair and see Grigsby Blot and Fotheringay running into millions of capital, spreading all round the world. Uh I suppose that San Francisco is pretty nearly all around the world, isn't it? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Why do you ask? Well, I was just wondering. Do you happen to know how long it takes to get here from San Francisco? Three weeks or a month, I should say. But why? Why? Well, well three weeks anyway. Certainly all that. But why do you ask? I was just wanted to know. I've got a sort of relation out there. Is that all you've got to tell us, Mr. Winch? That's all I've got to tell you. Ah, oh, he's crazy. It doesn't begin to make sense. What's all this dope about roses and brambles, anyhow? Now you can't make a story out of that. He's screwy. That suit of his is a real, genuine English cop uniform. There's something in it. Fourth dimension or something. Yeah. Well, where'd he scram from? That's all that interests me. How about the clothes? Oh, to hell with the clothes. The Ed won't print a line of that stuff. You can have people disappearing all over the States. That's good copy, that is. But this guy, appearing suddenly, yeah, can't stuff him with that. But there's the clothes, I tell you, and his poor little toasted notebook. And notes you can't read. But it's true. He's a genuine English cop, and he's come straight here from Essex in a flash. How? Lord knows. 
But he came so fast that his shoes and his notebook are frizzled. This newspaper racket is plain nuts. We're supposed to be looking for something new. Well, here is something new. Something that's never happened before. And just because it doesn't fit in with any of the stock stories, we've got to cut it out. Just the same as we'd had to cut out any stories about flying and submarines or radio 50 years ago. It's new news. And the truth is, we mustn't have new news in a newspaper. You must let your imagination bear upon this. If you let this gift of yours just splash about, you'll waste it. It'll do no good to you or anyone else. Just a miracle here, a miracle there, just scattering miracles, cheap as dirt, but canalized, concentrated, monopolized, then it can be an immense thing. It is very attractive. Attractive? It's the logic of a thing. I see us springing up in a night to be giants of the distributing world. Big men, big business, big money, monopoly. We can't miss it. Now, I'd like to have the opinion of Mr. Banfield upon this. Mr. Banfield of the bank over the way. Yes. This is an extraordinary proposition, Major Grigsby. If you had told me two hours ago that, that miracles would be worked in this parlor and that I should be confronted with a project for a, a, a world net of miraculous chain stores, I should have scouted the idea. But you don't now. I do not. Mr. Fotheringay, I think you may count on having the London and Essex bank behind you. Yes, I see. That is the way it ought to be done. So I, I don't know much about finance and business management myself. But now, you, what you propose is that I should be sort of exclusive. Oh, you must confine your gift entirely to Grigsby, Blot, and Fotheringay. It's just there that I, I don't quite see it. Oh, why? Well, take this gift of healing and all that sort of thing. I, I don't want to make a business of that. I we could have free clinics in all our stores, healing Tuesdays and Fridays, and special bargain lines. Free, absolutely without charge. Yeah, well, we might do that, yeah. Then why don't we give all the stuff away? Well, why make a business of it? I... You can't do that. You positively can't do that. No, no, I, I suppose not, no. Well, wh why do we want to borrow money? And what did you say? Is issue debentures? You must have the thing on a sound financial basis. Ah, uh, we've got to make money by it. Solvency, yeah. sir, is the test of service. Yeah. But if we want money, why don't we make it right away? You can't do that without disastrous results. Look here. You mean you can't do that? It's illegal. That's a forgery. That note's a forged note. Now look at it. It's all right, isn't it? Oh, this, this won't do. You, you, you mustn't make money just when you want it. it strikes at the root of everything. It puts the whole banking system completely out of gear. People must want money. And they must want commodities. But if I can give them everything they want... But what, what incentive? What would they do? They wanted to do anything. Couldn't they... Couldn't they have some fun, like? Oh, no, no, no. I, I can assure you, my dear Mr. Fotheringham, I can assure you. I have studied these questions, very profound questions. Before you were born, human society is based on want. Life is based on want. Wild-eyed visionaries, I name no names, may dream of a world without need. Cloud cuckoo land. It couldn't be done. It, it hasn't been tried, has it? Oh, hello, Fallen Gate. Where have you been all morning? He's got the sack. Not I. I've been considering a business proposition. What would you think of Grigsby, Blot, and Fotheringay, miraculous stores, eh? I've had a firm proposal. Big business. I hadn't realized it before, but these, there's money in these miracles, properly handled. Big money. Gee. Miraculous stores, eh? Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Put us all out of work. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. You haven't signed on? No, I sort of felt I ought to think things over a bit first. Who's in this? Grigsby in the bank. Mr. Why make money for them? Why not make it for yourself? Why fatten up old Grigsby at Bamfield? No, you can't do it that way. You, you can't make money for yourself. Why not? Well, Mr. Bamfield explained it very clearly. You see, it would lead to social chaos. Universal bankruptcy. Break up the social system. Break up old Grigsby at Bamfield, you mean? No, he, he didn't think it ought to be done. He'd do it fast enough, he could do it himself. Huh? I tell you, Father and Gavy's chapter sucking onto you. Go if I had your gift. Well? I'd run the world. Well, it's a new idea. But it's all right. Hello, George. Hello, Making yourself prettier than ever, eh? 
wish I needn't do it. But still, it has to be done. Lipstick and powder. Why don't you do something for me like you did for Effie? Considering all you might do, I think you're pretty mean about your miracles. It won't flung to a diamond tiara or anything of that sort, I suppose. Why not? Yeah. Diamond tiara. Now. Look at yourself. Oh, it's lovely. It must be real. Of course it's real. You couldn't do a pearl necklace, George. Why not? Pearl necklace. Why keep on that old black dress? Let her be dressed in splendid robes like, uh, like, like Cleopatra in the movies. Now! Oh! Oh. Hey dear, you're wonderful. Oh. It's you who are wonderful, Mr. Father Gay. I, 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 I've never seen anything like it. If, if Bill could see me now, he'd faint. Be as you are before I change you. Now. Oh. Maggie. What are you doing here at this time of night? I don't know. I, I just came. I, I think I wanted to see you. Maggie, there's something frightening about this medical working. I told you to get advice about it. Get nothing but advice, but it's all different. I don't know where I am. I'm all full of wonders, and I, I, I daren't let them loose. I, I, I get thinking of things and wanting things. I, I can't tell you. I, I got a bad imagination, Maggie. I got a dangerous imagination. Well, what did I tell you? You go and see Mr. Maydig. You could see him tonight. He gives people advice in his parlor. I wonder what he'd tell me. Come in. There's a young man, sir, very anxious to see you. Name of Fotheringay. He says it's urgent. Fotheringay? I don't know him. Respectable? Not a mendicant. Oh, nothing of that sort. But he's in trouble, sir. He says he wants advice. Show him in, then show him in. I never refuse myself if it's like that. Always ready to give what I can give. Come in. Well, sir, what can I do for you? I was told that you sometimes give good advice to people. I have a peculiar sort of trouble. Go on. Well, a, a very extraordinary thing has happened to me. See, I, I used to think that I couldn't do anything, and now I find I can do, well, practically anything. By willpower. What do you mean, willpower? Work miracles. Miracles? Yes, miracles. N no end of them. My dear sir, there are no such things as miracles under the present dispensation. I can assure you of that. Would you think differently about it if I worked one? I should think it over. I have an open mind. No one can deny me that. Oh, well. Uh, here goes. What, what, what should it be? Make something appear? I'm sick of messing about with kittens and rabbits, bunches of flowers. I know. Let there be a real tiger. There, on the art rug now. Oh, that for a miracle? Something wonderful, yes. A miracle, no. You mean to say that wasn't a real tiger then on the art rug a minute ago? No, my dear sir, no. A joint hallucination. The thing is quite well known. Hallucination? Well, I'll bring it back. Oh, no, don't do that. Give it a foremark. Hallucinations don't leave footprints behind, do they? I'm willing to be convinced. Yes, sir. There are foremarks. Some large carnivore. You know, Mr. Mr. Fotheringay. Fotheringay, that was a miracle you did just now. You need have no doubt about it. It was a miracle. 
Can you do other things of the same kind? Well, I want to consult you about Mr. Manning. You see, I can. I can do all sorts of things. I can, I can heal people. I can clear things up and set things right. I can move things from one place to another. I can change things to other things. I, I don't seem able to get in, inside of people's minds. But apart from that, there, there doesn't seem to be a limit. Not a limit to what I can do. It's power. I never, what am I going to do about it? What would you do about it? What would anyone do about it if they had it? You know, Mr. Maddie, it's a very remarkable thing. Before I realized I had this power to work miracles, I thought I knew everything I wanted and couldn't get it. And now, now that I can have, in a manner of speaking, have everything, something seems to hold me back. Power! Power! My dear young man, what might you not do? What may you not do with the world? Healing, have you thought? Why not banish disease from the face of the earth? Do in one swoop what science and medicine have been striving to do little by little. A world without disease. If I hadn't thought of that, I, I, I just thought I'd go around, you know, and cure somebody here and somebody there. Sweep it all away. A world glowing with health, newborn. The world's great age begins anew. The golden years return. I see such splendor in this power of yours. Such hope for our race. Such starry hope. Talking of upsetting things, Major Grigsby and Mr. Bamfield were very anxious that I shouldn't upset things. They did seem to think there might be a, a catch in it. Well, what Mr. Bamfield said was that human beings were held together by money and by wanting money and, and things. And if they didn't want, what would there be for them to do? Bankers and businessmen save me from them. Man bankrupt in a world of plenty. I suppose they ought to have a better way of managing things. Of course, but will they ever trouble to do so until they're compelled, until things overtake them? No, sir. And that is where we begin. Tomorrow. Suppose every poor soul in the world found a five-pound note in hand, suddenly, so that they could go out and buy things. Think of that. Think of the effect of it. I would like to do that. You, you don't think there might be a catch in it? Will Mr. Bamfield have fit? Convulsions, I hope. Convulsions. Convulsions. And then healing all over the world. Everybody suddenly saying, ah, I feel strong, I feel well. Well, I, I don't, don't see any harm in that. Nor I. Oh, it, it might put the doctors out a bit, though. And why? Well, they naturally think it's their business to keep us healthy. Oh, heavens, are we to remain needy to please the bankers and the businessmen and unhealthy to provide fees for the doctors? Well, I just thought it might complicate things a bit, but... Well, sleep over it first. We shall have to provide for the doctors and the traders, I admit that. These things can't all be done in a rush. There's an inertia about things which has to be considered. I shall think and think and think. I shan't sleep, Mr. Fotheringay, not a wink. I shall keep vigil. The last night of human misery. The pause before the dawn. What a glorious thought. Will you be able to sleep? Well, I, I've had a pretty busy day. Oh, you are one of God's innocents. You will sleep. But I cannot bear that we should part like this. Let us do one simple good thing before we go to bed tonight. An earnest of all we mean to do. Let me think. One little thing. Ah, there's my neighbor, Colonel Wynne Stanley, chairman of the bench, full of influence, and all that influence against progress. He's always treated me with the utmost civility. I bear him no malice. He sits late at night and drinks. Drinks, I fear, far too much. I'm no pedant in these matters, but he, he boozes. He will be sitting there now, at the canter by his side. Change it to some simple, non-intoxicating fluid. And his house is all decorated with swords and weapons. Beat them into plowshares. Turn his swords into reaping hooks. Well, but will he like it? I rang six times. You go to bed too early, Moody. 
And now tell me, what the devil's the matter with this whiskey? It's gone wrong. It's lost its taste. It's flat. It's worse than flat. It's mawkish. It's the real old stuff, sir, out of the old jar. It's not the real old stuff, and it's not out of the old jar. What have you been doing to it, Moody? I assure you, sir. You can assure me I'm drinking whiskey when I know I'm not. What's going on? That's all I get water instead of whiskey that the house falls down. Man, go and see, man, go and see. Don't stand staring there. Something's yes. happened there. Poison. Poison. Moody, why don't you come and tell me? Well, I, I don't understand it, sir. I stepped through the hall about three minutes ago. Everything was as right as could be, and now it's... It's frightful, sir. What's frightful? What do you mean, frightful? What, what are you talking about? It's gone, sir. Gone? Oh? It's all the... All the swords are gone, sir. The whole collection. And there's a lot of other things that look like... Agricultural implements to me, sir, mostly on the floor. Such as this, for example. What is this? Blinking Bolshevik thing. What is it? What, what, what's it mean? What ah! the house going, man? Oh, Lord. If I could lay my hands on the fool, what's done this? Oh, the no police in you had done. Stolen my swords. I understand that. What it means by leaving this list. Fuck! Beats me. <sighs> Who's that ringing at this time of the night? I can't imagine. Don't imagine, don't imagine. Go and see, man. Yes. <clears throat> Anyone's playing any sort of game with me? Smithles. You come in, come in, confound you, come in and see what's happened to my weapons. Well, it's some more of it, sir. More what? There's been a serious outbreak of miracles in the district, sir. Quite beyond anyone's experience. Miracles? Yes, sir, miracles. Well, aren't such things. Not properly, sir, which makes it so disconcerting, sir. We didn't come here disturbing you this time at night about nothing. But seeing as you're the chairman of the bench, we thought you might be able to help. Well, what is it? What is it? It's about this Constable Winch of ours, what's been missing since last night. We've searched everywhere. We've dragged the mill stream. We've made inquiries up and down the railway line. Well, you don't expect me to find him for you, do you, at ten minutes to midnight? No, sir, but I've got a cable. What sort of a cable? A telegram, sir, from San Francisco. San Francisco? This dear Hendon. This Constable Winch? Missing stop appeared mysteriously here. Stop badly injured in street riot, provoked by himself. Some sort of a hoax. With all due respect, sir, it isn't a hoax. It's something more serious. It's that young fellow, Fotheringay. Fotheringay? Moody, I must have a whiskey. If I don't have a whiskey, my mind will give way. Yes, sir, but... Good Lord. Is that another miracle? I'll get another jar, sir. I'll get one with the seal unbroken. <coughs> Soap and water. It's nastier than that, sir. I should say it's one of these temperance drinks. Well, Moody, anything to say? Oh, sir. I got my weaknesses, but I'd as soon poison a baby as tamper with whiskey. If you ask me, it's fathering gay again, sir. Fathering gay, more fathering gay. I'll keep calm. 
I owe it to myself and everybody to keep calm. Oh, perfectly calm. I'll see this fellow tomorrow. No fuss. I'll talk to him quietly, calmly. No good getting heated. I'll have it out with him. Oh, bring him to me, Smithles. Sort of casually. Just for a bit of advice. In my garden. Don't alarm him. And keep an eye on him when you're bringing him. Keep your truncheon up your sleeve. If he raises a finger, if he so much as looks like San Francisco, club him. I'll see you through. <laughs> ah, so that's the little medical worker. Don't look like it, little cad. Spoiled my whiskey, ruined my collection. Calmly, calmly. <clears throat> well, Mr. Superintendent, so this is the young man they wanted me to see, is it? This is Mr. Fotheringay, sir, as directed. <clears throat> At your service, sir. I want to talk with you. I want a serious talk with you. Chairman of the bench and deputy lieutenant, the former owner of a valuable collection of weapons, and the proprietor of a once powerful cellar, <coughs> as a fellow citizen of the unfortunate Constable Winch, I want, naturally and properly, a talk with you. I want, if I may say so, an explanation. Well, how I wish to know. Why, it's almost as hard. See, I just seem able to do things. Yes, and nice, friendly things you do, eh? Well, it's hard to know what to do without offending people. Offending people? Well, how the devil else do you expect me to take that trick with my whiskey and my collection? Oh, Mr. Maydig. Maydig? Uh, yes. What, oh, that new preacher chap? What's he got to do with it? Well, he was, he was advising me. Advising you? Yeah. He, he said if for once you should go to bed sober. Would you mind saying that again? Yes, if you wasn't to drink too much. Go on, sir, go on. I can bear it. I want to hear you out. Then we might uh, make it a sort of a symbolical action of change, of changing your weapons, see? That would sort of prepare your mind for the peace of the world. And when might that bid you? Oh, very soon now. Uh, peace and plenty. Mr. Maidig made it very plain how we were to set about it. You're going to set about it? When? I'm seeing Mr. Maidig at 12, and I suppose we'll start the golden age somewhere in the afternoon. I suppose they'll start the golden age somewhere in the afternoon. They suppose they'll start the golden age somewhere in the afternoon. <clears throat> Under the circumstances, I hardly like to mention my collection and my whiskey. Oh, don't mention it. We didn't mean to annoy. I'll, I'll make it all right now. Is that all you do, just that? That's all. The miracle's done and my whiskey's whiskey and... The collection back again? Yes, you can go and see it if you like. The extraordinary thing is I can do these things. Well, I could I could turn this garden into a into a palm tree forest and fill it with tigers. There's no limit to what I can do. There's no limit to what you can do. You. Me. Just thing comes out of me. You can do practically anything. Do you want me to do anything now? But a fellow of your sort. Well, why not a fellow of my sort? Do you want me to do a medical for you? Something big? Well, perhaps it's just as well to know what we're up against. All right. How'd you like to see India again, eh? Um, some place in India. Bombay. Let's both be in Bombay now. Right. Well, Colonel, are you satisfied we're in Bombay? It's changed a bit. I recognize it. Yes, I'll admit, we're in Bombay. How the devil we're going to get back, heaven knows. I had to talk some in after lunch. That's all right, you shall. Let's both be back in the Colonel's garden at Dewinton now. Well, is it all right? Can I work miracles or can't I? No doubt of it. Talk about abolishing distances.
May I see? What did I tell you? Yes, I see. Yeah. Now, Mr. Mady, he has ideas. He has imagination. There's no sense in going on with business and banking and all that, seeing these gifts that have come to me, because that's what Mr. Mady calls a want system, and we're going to live in a plenty system. There's no need for people to be hard up anymore, no need for people to be sick and ill and hungry, no need for robbing and cheating, and no need for war. No need for anything, as far as I can see. It'll be different, but Mr. Mady says you can't work miracles and stay as you are. But if you put an end to war, sir, as I gather you intend to do before tea time today, and as I'm beginning to believe you can, if you put an end to competition, make work unnecessary, give people more money than they know what to do with, then I ask you, what are people going to do, sir? What are they going to do? Well, I'm a, I'm a bit puzzled about that myself. But Mr. Medig says we just ought to go about loving one another. Go about loving one another. Go about loving one another. You... Are you mad, sir? Are you human? Have you no sense of decency? The most private, the most sacred feelings. Mr. Medig seemed to feel so differently about it all. Of course, there's, there is art and science and making things. Fret work and... Fret work and foolery. Well, we can give it a trial, I suppose. There's no telling what human beings will do. Mr. Maidig says... Mr. Maidig says, Mr. Maidig says, if you are going to start this bedlam millennium of yours within six hours, what's going to happen to us? What's going to become of us all? I don't really know exactly that myself. It'll be a bit of a change. But Mr. Maidig... Oh! Says... Mr. Fotheringay, won't you give all this business a few hours, a few days' consideration before you let it rip? I mean, after all, we've got we've got a sort of order here, kind of civilization. We've got the empire. Yes, but see, that's all very well for people like you. But most of the people are well are people like me. Now, it's perfectly natural for people like you to want to keep things as they are. I'm all for letting them loose, see? I don't mind change. I think. Change might be a lot. But haven't we had enough change in the last hundred years? Railways, electricity, radio. <laughs> it shook us up a bit, but it hasn't hurt us. It hasn't killed us. <laughs> now I'm all for more and better change. What a perfect afternoon. And to think that it is New Year's Eve for the whole world. We are on the verge of the greatest change this earth of ours has ever known. Want will vanish and plenty rain. Ring out the old, ring in the new. You know, it's as though I wanted to loiter a little before the beginning and the end. Silly old earth, what a lesson you have to learn. You don't seem to realize how serious it all is. Well, we are sitting here in our old homes, our old habits, and our old ways of life. These two dangerous lunatics are going to change the world. Change us, change everything. You know their business ideas, Grigsby. Oh, you kill business, you kill credit. Leave the country open and an arm for anybody that cares to start an air raid. I tell you, this measly little draper's assistant's the most dangerous lunatic loose. I was thinking a lot last night. One or two points I'm not clear about at all. See, human beings have been brought up to live in a certain way. That's what Mr. Grigsby and Mr. Banfield mean. Now, if I give them plenty of money and plenty of everything, they're going to be a little bit like winning without playing a game. What are people going to do? Do you think people, people as a general rule, I mean, will take to artistic work and all that? But we must make them want. Ah, that's just where my miracle stopped, you see. I can't get inside people. I've tried a bit. No, no, I, I can turn them upside down. I can move them to San Francisco and back in a jiffy. I can make them rich and I can cure their illnesses. But people remain people. But you can influence them indirectly. Healthier people are happier people. Easier people are, kindlier people, people who are not vexed and driven are better. To a certain extent, to a certain extent. But isn't it going to let a lot of new desires loose? I've got some powerful desires. My dear young man, how often has it been my lot to hear that confession from young men in their strength? I know, I understand. We all have these powerful desires. Even in my case. Yes, never mind about your case. I'm talking about my case. Well, I assure you, there's nothing singular about you. Exactly. That's the whole trouble. These men are mad dogs. They have to be treated like mad dogs. It's our world and all we care for against their confounded antics. Well, it happens to see red. 
Lieutenant, hey, what happens to see red? There's such a thing as justification. There's that girl, Maggie Hoopo, told me to come along and see you. I know her. A very pure, simple, sensible girl. That's her. I'm very fond of her, very fond of her. But the girl, the sort of girl that sets me wanting, isn't her. Dear me, wandering of desire. You must restrain it. Why should I? I happen to want a girl called Ada Price. Maggie Hooper sews on my buttons and mends my socks. And she's perfectly lovely when she's sewing on my buttons, buttons and mending my socks. But there's a... Come and take me about Ada Price. The trouble is as old as the hills. You must resist temptation. Let your motto be service. Why should I? Why service? Why should I make everyone rich and healthy and, and get nothing out of it myself? Why should I let Bill Stoker blast him and get away with it? My dear sir. They're shooting at us. Lie down. Stop that. No more bullets. No bullet to hit me. Nothing to hurt me. The wound on my scalp stop bleeding and be healed. Me be invulnerable now! Here, you fire that shot. Let your gun barrel be solid. That's all this silly world can do to a man who can work miracles. Why well, never meant to do anything better for them than to help it? Well, now I'll find the man who fired that shot. I have a pretty good idea who it is. I suppose. Wouldn't it be as well to make me invulnerable, too? All in good time. I'll look after you for a bit. If I'm safe, trust me, everyone is safe. Come on. Come on, lad. I thought it was you. None of the others would have been as outright. You're a man of action. I knew it was you. There's no working against miracles. You've got to get ahead with your silly monkey tricks, I suppose. I tell you, I'm sorry I didn't get in with that first shot. Now get ahead with Mr. Maydig's magic millennium and see how you like it. No. You don't mean to say you've had a gleam of sanity? No, I've been learning hard and fast these last few days, Colonel. Perhaps there won't be a millennium. Perhaps there can't be a millennium. Maydig is full of ideas, but I have my feelings and it's me that's got to put it through. You don't mean to say that you're going to give up all the things we talked about just because he tried to shoot you? Oh, it isn't only that. Some of your things I shall do and some I shan't. I that work miracles, I, me that has the power. Why, this isn't the world of Grigsby or Bamfield. It's not going to be the world of the Reverend Silas Maidy. No, it's going to be the world of George McWhorter fathering again. As I want it, so it will be. What I want, I get. You, you have all of you just wanted to use me. Now I'm going to use myself. What for? To get. Just exactly what I fancy. That's the natural human thing to want, and that's what I want. I'm just beginning to get the hang of this miracle business. You've had your way. The only one of you that came near the common horse sense of it was Bill Stoker. And much good that'll do him when I've done with him. <laughs> Come along, matey. I may want you. We're going to start a world of George McWhorter Fotheringay right now in the Colonel's house. Has, has anything more happened? Happen what hasn't happened. He's mad and dangerous, and bullets won't kill him. I got my own ideas at last. This old world of yours is over. There's going to be a new, miraculous world, and it's going to be mine. I, I guess you think I'm being needlessly obstructive, but uh, uh, people have to, to adapt themselves. They must have time. Hasten slowly. And get nothing done. No, we're going to begin here and now, the, the world of George McWhorter Fotheringay according to his dreams and according to what he's been told and found out since he began thinking about things. One word, sir. Whatever you may think of Mr. Bamfield, you will at least admit that I am not unprogressive. I ask you, before you do anything else, make a plan. Nothing can be done without a plan. What plan? Balance, order, creative aims. Plan. 
Talk away in age, hesitate, sway to and fro, mess about. No, we're going to begin my new world now in my lifetime when I can enjoy it, glory in it, and have some fun in it. Wait, wait, let me go on just a little longer. Let this house be turned into a great, splendid, beautiful palace, and us in the great hall of it. Now! Architecture improving. Yes, but we we hardly seem dressed for it. Let us be sumptuously dressed according to our character and station, so as not to appear strange here. Me, the prince, Maid Egan Bamfield as counselor, and the colonel as the captain of the guard. You enjoy being captain of the guards, after a bit, Colonel. Uh, it looks empty here, isn't it? Off with your old regiment, Colonel. Let his old battalion be here, and dressed accordingly. Now! And let all the butlers and footmen in Essex be here, suitably dressed, same style as the building. Now! Well, now we have a place to work in, a place I can turn around in. You didn't think I liked things large, did you? You saw to it I was born small and grew small. Nobody likes being small. And now let's have here Miss Ada Price, as she was yesterday afternoon when I made her lovely. Now! This is something like a miracle. You're going it at last, George. Where's Bill? Can't you do without Bill for a moment? Uh, I thought you'd have Bill here somehow. All this is sort of his style. No, Ada. It's my style. There'll be two thrones here, now. Oh, you might have a throne for Bill. No, and that throne isn't for you either. Let Maggie Hooper be here, dressed as a queen, now. Well, Maggie, my dear, here we are beginning the miraculous reign of George McWhorter Fotheringay. What shall we do with the world, eh? Oh, don't make it dull and goody-goody. Uh, George, I didn't mean to say that about Bill. I didn't. You said it. Plenty of your sort. You just stand down there looking lovely until I take notice of you. And just to keep you company, let the nine next prettiest girls in New Hinton be here. Beautifully dressed, too. Now! My world's gonna be full of pretty women. Ten a penny. Oh, dear George, make the world happy. Don't make it selfish or, or showy. Let this be really the world's great age. Begin anew. Justice, peace, plenty. You don't think I know how to do it. You shall see. Nothing in a hurry and nothing delayed. I've learned a lot in the last three days. I think I'm beginning to get the hang of it all. Let the greatest bankers in the world come here and stand here. Now! Let the leading men who own and direct great businesses stand here. Let the chief men who rule the world, the politicians, the presidents, the councillors, the commissioners, the people who tell the newspapers what to say, the people who teach and preach, let them come here. Yes, all of them, now! <laughs> Here we are for a great big talk together. I'm just anybody, and you're the people who rule the world. I've been told to take thought, take counsel, so I've got you here, all of you. Why not? <laughs> now I've got you. Now I've got the whole crowd of you. You people who have your faces in the newspapers, people who sit in high places, walk through crowds and get all the praises and the cheers. I've got you people who run the world to tell you to run it better. Run it better. You've lived on the fat of the world. You've been trusted with the world. 
Chaps like me have had to trust you, willy-nilly. And what did you do for us? What sort of a deal did you give us for all the trust we gave you? What was our share? Oh, I know. I had to wait, 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 young and seedy and died. Be patient for umpty years while you held all the stuff in your hand and did nothing. Much your crowd cared. Did you worry about it? Not a bit. But you better worry now. <laughs> and why have you never stopped war? Why, a hundred men in high places, resolute men, not afraid of a little brain work, could have put a stop to war forever any time these last 20 years. But I guess you liked the bands and the spurs and the feathers too much, and you never thought about chaps like me. Nice and pompous you look, reviewing the troops, being saluted. And did you really forget about chaps like us? Not even that. A trench full of dead chaps like me made you feel all the more real and important, eh? Who's shooting at me? I've been shot at. Won't work. There's an end to shooting. Can't shoot truth. I'm here and I'm going to stay here. George McWhorter Fotheringay. Power has gone out of your hands. You can smirk and strut, smile, look important for a little while, perhaps. But I tell you, power has gone out of your hands. That's your sun setting now. It's late afternoon for the whole crowd of you. God, oh, you know it. And where's he gone to, this power? It's come to me, a common vulgar fella that has driven me wild. It's come to me by a miracle. You, you better do something and do it soon. You've got to make a new world that'll make me happy. Get together, you important people. Try to be really important. Talk it over among yourselves, but talk real stuff. Do it quickly and do it now. And if you don't do what I tell you, I'll wipe you out as a child wipes a slate. That's me. That's what I've found in me since I began looking. That's what I've dug out of George McWhorter Fotheringay. But they must have time to think about it. Time, if I gave them time, they'd just waste it. They've had generations of time, those people, and what do they do with it? But these things cannot be done instantly. They are going to be done here and now. A good and happy world, a sensible world. Then, when I've got that off my chest, I'll see. I'll see what's to be made of living. Inertia! Oh, inertia. I'm always up against inertia. I've got a power in me that calls for change. I'm tired of your old world and its inertia. Give them at least the tomorrow. The sun is setting. Give them the night to think and discuss. Don't worry about the sun setting. I can stop that sun from setting. I want my new world now. But you can't stop the sun setting. What? I say I can. I'll stop that sun setting. I won't let it set. Not till I'm ready to go to bed and everything's cleared up. But then you have to stop the earth rotating. And I will. Now don't argue with me, Medic. Don't argue with anyone. There's a time when argument stops. Earth, stop rotating. Stop now! <laughs> He stopped the world going round. Not suddenly. Yes. Then everything loose is being flung about by its own inertia. And that's the end of your nasty little pets upon their silly little planet. Preposterous. What did I tell you? It's all over. Gone. <laughs> working miracles, then on the word go, let me not be able to work any more miracles ever. Forget it. Forget all about it. Wipe it out. No more miracles. You can't control them. Go! And what has your experiment shown, brother? What did you get out of that sample man? Egotism and elementary lust. A little vindictive indignation. That's all the creatures have, or will have, forever. What can you make of them? They were apes only yesterday. Give them time. Once an ape, always an ape. 
No, there is something in every one of those creatures more than that. Like a little grain of gold glittering in sand, lost in the sand. A flash of indignation when they think things are false and wrong. That's godlike. Dirt is never indignant. That is why they interest you. But their indignation is selfish. They are in a mess. They were made for the mess. They will never get out of their mess. But if I give them power, not suddenly, but bit by bit, if I stir thought and wisdom into the mess to keep pace with the growth of power, broaden slowly, age by age, give the grains of gold time to get together. And in the end, it'll be the same. No, it will be different. Come back here in an age or so, and you shall see. All right, then. Then along comes someone, as it might be me, and stands, stand, as it might be here, and says, as I might do, collecting all my willpower, and I'm doing it, mind you, I'm playing fair. Here you. Turn upside down without breaking, and go on burning steady. There you are, you see. Nothing happened. No, of course, nothing could happen. It wouldn't be sense. No. And miracles aren't sense. All the same, I sometimes wish I could work miracles. I wonder what you'd do if you could work miracles. I'd make this world a better place, within reason. There are one or two things I'd like to do myself. Ah, but you won't ever have the chance. No. I won't ever have the chance. Now. Mm -hmm. 